To Lucky Paper Radio. I'm your host, Andy. I'm here, as always, with my co-host, Anthony Blue. No, no, wait, Red! Maddox. Hi, Anthony. Mistakes were made. Sometimes you forget that other colors can exist, and you just blurt out a thing because you're distracted and trying... You know what? That's the really important thing is I don't like I don't like that card because I was disrupted in my yep. draft. Yep. We we're talking about uh we did a draft yesterday of a Demir only cube. So blue and black cards in the cube only. And I picked was drafting next to Anthony and I picked the card Regicide, which is a conspiracy card that says the player to your right picks a color, the player to your left picks a different color, you pick a third different color, and then that card can destroy creatures of any of those three colors. And Turned to you and said, what do you pick? And you said, blue. And I said, great. <laughs> and you said, Very graciously no. and generously. You said, wait, no, 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 no. So then, here's what happened. If, I, if, if you'd given me, I don't know, four seconds to think about it and figure out what was happening, I understand what the card does. You could have taken four seconds you, to think you, about it. I wasn't rushing you. But that's the thing is I was rushing me because I was trying to look at my own pack and yeah. figure out what's going on. And I think yeah. that is something that is really critical to think about the way we look at cards in packs is that there is this context and time pressure. And that's honestly a reason that I don't let love regicide is it, it's just kind of disruptive. Mm-hmm. So my immediate thought was specifically because you said, oh, this card is busted in this context. And I look, well, I look at the card you were taking and I was like, oh, right, because blue and black are the only colors here. So it kills everything. And so I just said, OK, blue. So mm-hmm, yeah. I have a confession to make. It's fun to dunk on you. But I you also thought, I that. also that's thought that. why, so that's why I feel like I heard it in your voice. You <laughs> set me up. I accidentally you led set you. me up to think that. Yeah, I, I also was like, oh, this is going to kill everything. And then mm-hmm. you said blue. And I was like, wait a minute. So you were gifted. Kill you were gifted with swords to plowshares <laughs> for no reason. Uh, Yeah, it's was, it was fine. Everything was fine. We all you know, it's hard context was different it was a demir only cube the card is weird so a lot of things were off but yes i misunderstood the card when i took it you misunderstood it in the same way when you named blue i appreciate you uh expressing solidarity yeah i I, I gotta come clean i gotta come clean with the fact that uh that's that's what happened there it was a cool cube but i agree regicide and those draft matter cards they're uh they're sometimes treat for me i mean it's fine like that is such a minor detail but those are also the minor details that we like to go way too deep on so here it is it's true. Anthony, this week is our Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate cube set review. In the past, we've done kind of multiple stages of the set review. We have one episode dedicated to the mechanics, another episode dedicated to our personal cube inclusions, and then a third episode dedicated to the community's response. We're doing them all in one episode this time, I think mostly because you and I don't have that many of our own cube inclusions in this set. And we're also, the new mechanics we're looking at are going to appeal to such a small chunk of cube curators which we'll see from looking at the results of the survey that i don't think it warrants an entire episode of podcast dedicated to them so that's why we're putting it all in here but there is also a new set coming out every month and it's exhausting yeah well i mean i like talking about magic cards i'm not going to say it's exhausting but uh but yeah three episodes would be a lot if we dedicated all that to uh, commander legends Baldur's gate but Anthony, it's a set review episode, so we are not alone. We are, of course, joined by your number one source for academic papers on lubrication, Parker Lamascus. Hi, Parker. Hello, and I feel obligated to qualify that I have not yet actually published many papers on lubrication. I do have one, so if that's your number one source, then... See, when you were talking about this in the Discord, I thought you were just saying, if you need 
me to reference or like point you to other people's academic oh, yes. papers on lubrication. I'm, I'm your guy. Like I am the, that person. Yeah. You're, you're the lubrication librarian for all the various academic papers on, uh, on slippy sliding. Yes, I, I am that person. Now, are you mostly looking at liquid lubrication, like uh, powder lubrication? What kind of lubrication are you mostly dealing with? I mostly work with oils in the context of engines and gears. But I do know many colleagues who work on solid lubricants, dry lubricants, nanoscale, like monolayer lubricants, and even personal lubricants. There you go. All the lubricants you could possibly need. Thanks for joining us, Parker, to talk about this set. Before we get to the results of our community survey, I think we should just run down the new mechanics in the set pretty quickly. Again, I don't think there's a lot to discuss here. Mostly because, again, we'll see that most of these mechanics are not that appealing to many cube creators. I think there's reasons for that that we can get into. Uh, The first new mechanic is backgrounds. This is basically uh, similar to commander partners, where you can, you know, pair a commander with another commander that both have the partner ability. Except in this case, the backgrounds are a set of enchantments with a special type. And there are a set of commanders that have the choose a background ability. And those partners can basically be paired with any of the background enchantments to augment their abilities, augment their color identity, that sort of stuff for all the deck building purposes. It's just partner again, (laughs) partner but different. Uh, I don't have any like game design thoughts about this. A lot of the commander cards uh, seem like they're inherently rubbing up against the tension that makes commander what it is in the first place, right? Like the whole point of being limited by your commander's color identity and the mechanics on your commander's card uh, has been consistently like just stretched further and further and further to include more things. And this is the latest example of Commander can be whatever you want. Which isn't fair because Cube is the format where it can be whatever you want. And so Commander shouldn't take that from us. <laughs> yeah. So in, in, in the context of Cube specifically, you know, there are a lot of people that have multiplayer cubes. A lot of people have Commander specific cubes. Most of the people that do have Commander cubes that follow the like original rules of Commander have some kind of unique draft rules around drafting Commanders, right? They're not just putting them in the packs a lot of the time. And so because of that, I think backgrounds is another layer of complexity, another layer of uh, of just stuff to think about, which complicates the drafting your commander mechanic that uh, just adds another layer to cubes that I think maybe a lot of players are not particularly excited by. So I actually do, I, I will stand up for the the background mechanic a little bit here. And, and for context, I really don't love partner as a mechanic. I just, I think it feels very clunky. It kind of feels like it's coming from the space where it's like, oh, you like commander because you have a commander. What if you had two commanders? That's twice as good. And really what I, it's sort of the way it shapes the format a little bit differently is it takes away a little bit of the flavor from it where it's not like, here's my general who's leading this right. very flavorful army. It's just like, oh yeah, I've got a whole bunch of these things. And a lot of them, they they just aren't as flavorful. They're a little bit more open and flexible mechanically. So it's more just about getting the right combination of colors and this sort of like free card advantage. The background mechanic actually does a better job, I think, of sort of reinfusing that kind of idea of your commander and even more like customizing your commander. It's not about just, oh, I've got two now, but here is my Voltron that I've assembled. Here is my one character and his backstory, which obviously fits perfectly with the D&D theme as well, that you're building this character that literally has a backstory. So I, I, I think that this is a much cooler execution of the partner, partner mechanic. From a game design perspective, from like a drafting perspective, I think it's also a little bit weird in that like, well, we have to have this commander, we have these color identity rules, and we're kind of like fixing the color identity problem, where I definitely feel like that's something that is already fixed by like the resource system and the way that magic works. So I'd rather just say like, let's cast off this color identity rule, which doesn't serve us the same way to the same degree in a draft anyway. But there's a whole episode, there's a whole episode dedicated to uh, Anthony's thoughts about that, which we will link in the show notes. I think another reason cube designers are maybe a little bit low on this is that if you're going to include the backgrounds and you're not going to house rule it so backgrounds can be paired with any legendary creature, you're kind of priced into including a certain density of the legendary creatures that say choose the background. And if those creatures don't align with your current cube design goals, then, you know, a lot of things have to line up for a cube designer to be excited about the background mechanic because it kind of has a bunch of baggage it brings along with it. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you can play these cards in isolation. The cards still do stuff, but... Either there's just some extra text that doesn't matter if you're not playing a whole bunch of them or or potentially uh, they just aren't pulling their weight in the way you want them to. So I think for a lot of people, it's kind of a package deal. Either you're going all in and including this big pile of cards or it's kind of not for you. The next new mechanic in this set is the initiative. This one is, boy, and I have feelings about this mechanic too. This is basically a monarch style mechanic where 
once the initiative is introduced to the game, exactly one player in the game has the initiative at any given time, and the initiative can be stolen by a player dealing combat damage to the player that has the initiative. And if a player leaves the game, then uh, whoever his turn it is when that player leaves the game becomes the uh, becomes the player with the initiative. This also has additional rules associated with it, where when you gain the initiative, you venture into a specific dungeon that you can only venture into when you have the initiative. Uh, what is that dungeon called again? The Undercity. The Undercity. So that is a unique set of uh, choices you can make through the Undercity. The Undercity, I would say, is a pretty powerful dungeon. I would say probably more powerful than the other dungeons we've seen. So if that's the thing you care about, then that is, of course, uh, a factor of this mechanic. And then there are also cards in the set that are, get augmented if you have the initiative. Similar to that, there are some cards, I believe, that get a little better if you have the monarchy in, uh, in the conspiracy sets that included the monarchy. So... This is another mechanic that, uh, you know, we saw dungeons perform not that well on our past cube surveys that people, cube designers in general, not that thrilled about having a whole nother card, a token card that you have to care about uh, outside of the game. It's this other additional piece that you have to follow. We've talked before in this show about how, in a practical sense, the venture into the dungeon mechanic is entirely self-contained. You can include exactly one card that says venture into the dungeon. It doesn't need other cards that venture into the dungeon to you know, be relevant or to function. It can just function on its own, and it gives this kind of modal ability that triggers whenever they think ventures into the dungeon. But in reality, having a whole other card and a whole named mechanic dedicated for just a couple cards or one card in your cube is not something a lot of people were particularly interested in. And so here, I think, uh, again, we see another mechanic that is going to suffer for the same reasons Venture into the Dungeon suffered. And this one also introduces another layer of complexity, which I already felt like dungeons, you know, felt more complicated than they were because of all this additional, like, all right, what are your next possible choices? I have to think about what's going to what could potentially happen in three turns if you venture to the dungeon three times. Then you reread that dungeon again. So it's kind of a conglomeration of monarchy and Venture into the Dungeon in a very particular way. I'm actually going to be a defender a little bit of this mechanic as well, which also might be a surprise. It is super complicated. Uh, There's just a lot going on here. But I do really like the Monarch mechanic specifically in multiplayer. In two-player, really not so much. It kind of snowballs and the player that's ahead stays ahead. But in multiplayer, it does this really cool thing of forcing combat. And forcing combat... Which is one of the problems of multiplayer that we've talked about is that inherently attacking another player just makes you susceptible to attacks from the other two players. And so... In terms of the game theory mechanics of the entire table, it's generally in a vacuum not advantageous to be proactive and aggressive in multiplayer games. So for sure, I think that's why the mechanic was designed that way, because it def- definitely helps solve that problem. So I think by twisting that monarch mechanic a little bit to not just be draw a card, which is kind of boring and kind of extremely powerful, to be something that offers more agency and maybe you care about getting specifically into the Undercity because you have a creature that you want to power out or you really need a certain basic land to fix your mana uh, is cool and relevant, I think, opens up a lot of possibilities in a multiplayer game. I also think it's a very cool way to get more dungeons present, because I think a lot of people immediately when they saw dungeons thought, well, cool, what are they going to print the next set of dungeons? And they couldn't really do that in the sense of just, here's a new dungeon, because that would just be functionally adding a bunch more text to a bunch of cards. It wouldn't be right. like... Now really, I can put, really hard to balance that. Yeah, it wouldn't be just a matter of saying like, oh, well, now they print a new equipment, I can put this in my equipment deck. It would just be like, oh, this creature that cares about equipment now has all of this extra text of this new equipment built into it. Yeah. So it's a cool way where they can say, this still interacts with other dungeon cards because it's other dungeon cards will still push you through the Undercity, but you can only enter it through a card that actually cares about this specifically. It's also nice that it continues to... You continue to adventure through this dungeon via the initiative, even if you don't have other stuff that cares about dungeons. So as far as a self-contained mechanic where you can just put one card in a deck and have it like still be a meaningful thing to the game, I think actually works a lot better than than uh, previous dungeon cards. It's definitely very flavorful. And, you know, obviously, I think the dungeon mechanic was pretty clearly a top-down mechanic. They were making the Dungeons & Dragons set. They had to have dungeons. They probably work backwards from that and try to figure out what dungeons could be. And so I think it wins in that regard. But uh, from a cube design perspective and putting this into an environment I'm designing, it's just a ton of baggage and very, very clunky for me to ever consider any of these cards. I'm definitely going to be considering some of these for specifically a multiplayer cube. Yeah, I think, well, it's telling that I did not know the rules text until you read it. So every card which mentions taking the initiative does not define the term. And I guess Monarch is a similar way because there's a there's a card outside the game that references that but yeah boy it's it's kind of tough from a complexity standpoint and just logistical overhead standpoint 
I'm actually going to defend this from one other oh, standpoint. Boy. Okay. Uh, thinking about this in the context of a D&D set, you're totally right. It's kind of silly. It's like, here's this effect. Nothing about it's written on the card. We have to go figure get the comprehensive rules and read them and figure out what this does. How different is that from, oh, I attack with my short sword. What does my short sword do? Oh, let me go pull out my character sheet, figure out what my You're modifier right. is. You're right. It very flavorfully <laughs> has the, the flavor <laughs> of of digging through your uh, D&D player's handbook. It, is it very valuable. flavorfully has the exact same flaws as Dungeons and Dragons exactly. as a game. <laughs> exactly. And in that way, it is uh, spiritually united with it. We also have uh, Myriad making a return. This is a mechanic that's a keyword on creatures that says when this creature attacks an opponent, you create a token copy attacking each other opponent. Another great example of a multiplayer mechanic that uh, encourages uh, aggression. You know, it rewards you for attacking, which again is something that is kind of implicitly disincentivized by the multiplayer structure. I have no thoughts about this otherwise, other than it's a great mechanic. And I, I feel like there are actually relatively few Myriad cards in all of Magic's history. I know when... We were talking about making a multiplayer cube. I've thought about it in the past myself. It was something I sort of looked up immediately. I was like, how many Myriad cards are there? That's very compelling to me. And there were so few of them. So getting more Myriad cards seems like a, a real win for anybody that's designing a multiplayer environment. Yeah, I agree. There were actually only a very few printed in one set, one cycle of commander sets a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, meaning forever ago. I think it's probably six years ago at this point. And I, I thought it was actually a super cool mechanic that the individual cards were all just balanced in a way that even like among those pre-cons, that it just wasn't super relevant. So I was really excited to see more Myriad cards if I'm honest, looking through them, a lot of them have maybe similar balance issues where they're just not going to be appropriate in a lot of places. But Where's the smuggler's copter of we need, Myriad we need, cards? <laughs> I mean, there's there are a couple pretty powerful ones, but it, overall, I'm excited to see this come back. And uh, maybe after playing with these cards, we'll see them play a little bit differently. We also see the return of Gates as a, even more of a mechanic than we've seen it before. We have two cycles of gates. One of them is very much just a copy of the, the Thriving Lands from Jumpstarts. They're gates that tap for mana of one color, they enter the battlefield, you choose a second color, and so you have your super guild gate that has some more flexibility. There are also a bunch of gates that just care about gates in other ways. So, And some of the most powerful care about gates cards we've ever seen. Absolutely, and it's interesting that they are lands. We've seen in some of the recent Ravnica sets cards that, uh, you know, gates ablaze. and Again, recent, that was about four years ago. This is this is how it goes. <laughs> the, uh, the, the Colossus, gate, the gate angel, the, the, the seven mana Colossus. Colossus that gets cheaper for gates you control. So those were sort of cool payoffs for these gates. But I find that these gates that are lands, that are gates, that care about gates are very interesting in that they're kind of a secret way to kind of seed in an extra mechanic or an extra archetype into your cube where if you're already playing on a budget or at low power for whatever reason you play a bunch of gates that's great and now you could just throw in these six lands or so and suddenly somebody who's already taking gates for fixing lands could actually have this sort of second strategy running through the deck which i think is a very cool opportunity from a cube design perspective i know a lot of especially pauper and peasant cube designers really like the thriving cycle of lands so getting yeah. another another copy of those if you're playing singleton lands or getting cards that are strictly different i mean i guess there's probably nothing is there anything that actually hates on gates is there anything that makes a gate worse than a regular land i'm not sure there is so it's another opportunity for you to include additional mechanics that care about a certain subset of your lands uh, by replacing your thriving lands with these uh, thriving gates as it were which i think is, is a win for cube designers across the board while we're talking about them this maybe is like jumping ahead a little bit in our survey results but these do it thriving gates were the highest rated cards of the entire survey which is pretty significant because I think the people who are interested in these know just how well they fit their environments. So they weren't tested by a lot of people, only 5% of our respondents, but people who are interested are like very much invested and know that these will fit their design goals. Yeah, I, this is, a, I think, a classic example of the known quantity will get a high rating because if you're already playing Thriving Lands and you know you want the gate subtype, then you know these are going to be as good as Thriving Lands are, which is a card you have a lot of experience with. So the high rating, I think, makes a lot of sense on the Thriving Gate cycle. The last thing I'll mention here is just that, you know, we've said in the past, talking about Thriving Lands, that uh, one thing that at least I don't love about them, I've, I think you agree with me, Anthony, I'm not sure, Parker, what you think about this, is that, you know, they feel like they're kind of hybrid dual lands, right? Like I take the red thriving land if i'm going to be any red x combination of colors right my red blue deck my red green deck my red white deck and it has that cool flexibility when in reality you can actually just play a quote-unquote off-color thriving land because if you're a blue white deck 
you put the red thriving land in there and it's either a blue or a white source and you just ignore the red part because you're never going to use that and so for that reason the thriving lands to me like there is one of each color but they're all kind of the same card to me and not actually unique cards in that sense which dings them a little bit uh in terms of my like evaluation of them from a like cleanliness and game design perspective yeah i agree you could definitely consider that just a benefit right because yeah it makes them more flexible but at that point if if i'm 90 percent of the time not caring about the the actual like built-in color then that's probably not that appealing to me as a designer and i'd rather just play evolving wilds which also has the downside of more shuffling but the upside of less memory issues and the upside of uh working with delve or whatever absolutely now like, I agree with that. And could I perhaps interest you in a land, which I am looking up at this moment? Cryptic Spires is the name. Yes, which is like a thriving land, but you circle two colors as you create your deck, and then it taps for the chosen two colors. Do that's you think the that's wrong. That's the wrong set. We're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that, that's technically uh, that's technically Double Masters 2022 coming up. I gotta say, real quick on this though, I feel like I was being gaslit by some people on the server because I was like, "This is so weird." People were like, "This isn't weird." What do you mean it's not weird? They printed a new card in a reprint set that requires you to draw on the face of the card, a thing we've never seen before. Uses a novel card frame we've never seen before. It's confirmed weird. It's very strange. No, it's it was- totally normal. One playtest card, which had like scratch off areas. Yeah. Or something. Anyway, we'll get to that. We're probably not going to do it. Yeah, we're going to do a set review. We're going to get, to a get ready to uh, make sure you subscribe to the newsletter so you can uh, be ready to uh, fill out the survey for Double Masters 2 and tell us if you're going to test Cryptic Spires and how highly <laughs> you rate it. <laughs> we just a whole survey with just Cryptic Spires. And 100% of our respondents are testing Cryptic Spires because you can't submit the survey without selecting a single card. We'll update card. that. We'll update that so you can submit an empty survey. Uh, the highest performing card there ever. There is also an option. You can turn, You can actually submit reprints. There's a little checkbox in there somewhere. Nobody ever does it. But if if you if you want. I was going to say, we could uh, we could ask people just what cards are going to become cheap enough for them to finally get in paper for their cubes. Right. With, it, uh, so the survey masters. also does flag cards that have rarity shift. So again, that like, is relevant. Okay. We are just, okay, we're getting around to We're just doing. analyzing what, whatever data that we get given the way we've chosen to collect it. So if could, a bunch of people follow the survey and say, yeah, I, I have a commons only cube and I'm testing all these downshifts, we will post the results. I guess we have to put we're that gonna up We're going to do now. it. We're going to oh, do okay, it. Okay, we're going to do it, I guess, apparently. And yeah, we could also add the dramatic price drop checkbox. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think we just did the uh, set review in, <laughs> in that one. It was basically it, yeah. Crypt expires discussion. Thanks for listening to uh, Set Review and Side of Set Review. Look, you get two side reviews in this episode. That's a two for one. Should we just dive into discussion of single cards and perhaps cover in that discussion if any of us are testing any of these cards in our own cubes? Does that make sense? I think so. Before that, I, I do want to cover some just broader statistics about the set. So in case you, you know, maybe your main format is Commander and, and you own a Commander cube and you haven't listened to one of these set reviews before, the way they work is that we ask our respondents to give us two pieces of information. The cards that they're testing from the newest set, in this case, Baldur's Gate, and how that respondent rates those cards on a scale of one to three, according to whatever subjective criteria they want, whether that's power, whether that's how likely it is to fit the power level of their cube. What we ask them specifically is, how likely do you think it is that this card will stay in your cube long term? So whatever criteria that designer wants to use. Yeah, purely um, subjective. Purely subjective. Then we analyze the results. For Baldur's Gate, the median respondent to our survey is testing seven cards. And of those seven, they tended to give two cards a high rating of greater than 2.5. So on a scale of one to three, that's pushing the upper end. So they think two cards are kind of staples however they choose to define that term and they're testing seven that's roughly on par with sets within the past couple years like adventures in the forgotten realms the first dungeons and dragons set and even more recently innistrad crimson vow so neither of those sets were hugely popular relative to our entire history of these community surveys part of that is because baldur's gate isn't legal in one versus one constructed formats like modern so 
you know, you don't have LSV and Sam Black and, you know, well-known pros writing highly visible set reviews. Yep. And I think that's going to be a big factor. Another kind of interesting quirk of this survey is that although it kind of resembles, on average, Innistrad Crimson Vow, Innistrad's results were localized around a few cards that were pretty interesting to many people. I think, was that the adversary cycle or? I believe so, yeah. I think it was the Illuminator cycle, actually. But those got a lot of hype. Um, and so a lot of people were testing those cards. By contrast, Baldur's Gate, no card has captured more than even 15% of all testers. So people are testing a lot of cards from this set, but they do not at all agree on which cards are most interesting to them, which is, I, I think, really kind of unique to this set among all of the ones that we've studied in the past. Yeah, for Maybe sure. it's just a function of how big this set is and how, even though we talked about some main clusters of mechanics, we'll find that there are one-off mechanics popping up here and there, mechanics like Fortell or Adventure or Gates again. So yeah, I, I think there are just like these little pockets of cards that interest very different groups of curators. Yeah, I think that's really true. And especially like you're describing these recurring mechanics that people know and love, like Adventure, I think is a huge one where a lot of people I really love, love adventure. adventure. So and it's something that's difficult for Wizards to print back into standard legal sets. So using this set as an opportunity and obviously a very flavorful opportunity to put more of these cards, uh, I think it's just going to appeal to that particular segment of the, the cube community, which is very different from the segment that's going to be interested in things like backgrounds and myriad. It's like... I don't know if I if I had to sum it up in one sentence, it's like got something for everyone, but people didn't agree on what that was. I feel like looking at the results of this survey, which we encourage everybody to do at, at the time of this episode being released, the results are published on luckypaper.co. So go check them out for yourself. But it's very telling to me looking at the results here. Like, for example, the fifth most popular card is a card called Winter Eladrin, Eladrin and it's got almost 8% of respondents testing it. And this card is essentially just a mana war it's a three mana two two in blue that bounces a thing on etb you know there's differences in terms of type line and stuff but we've seen variations of this card so so many times that i don't look at this card and get excited at all for any cube project because i already have this tool it's been in my toolkit for a long time but seeing this card so high again just kind of tells me that a lot of people just aren't digging into this set because they don't have a resource like Parker mentioned where constructed players are going through and kind of flagging the most powerful or most dynamic or most unique cards in the set or uh, you know they don't have another resource to kind of look to that's just doing this work for them and honestly I think I'm starting to come around to the idea that more cube designers than I think are really more curatorial in the sense that they are shopping around for you know cards and packages other people like and kind of including them together but not spending a lot of time you know pouring over every set for themselves for their own design goals to find a card that actually fits which I mean, it's a time-consuming thing. It makes sense that not everybody yeah. has the time to do that. It takes a lot of work. I I have an Eldraine set cube. It's like, you can think of it as Eldraine remastered. And so I had to, I, of course, I had to look through this entire set because they're printing adventures. And, and that's just yeah, perfect buddy. in an Eldraine environment. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I don't blame anybody who, you know, hasn't looked through the entire card file. But, but Baldur's Gate in particular, I think will reward a careful search because... It just hasn't been done by by pros or, or anybody, really. Yeah, and between the set itself and the corresponding commander decks, which also have unique cards in them, there are just so many cards to pour through here. It is much bigger than a regular standard legal set in terms of just the number of cards to look at. So definitely yeah. a deep well for people to explore if, uh, if you haven't looked at it yourself yet. Shall we get to some discussion of individual cards, gentlemen? Let's do it. I have a couple of cards, so I, I think we should talk about, for sure, the top four most popular cards from the set, because there's a pretty big gap between the fourth and the fifth, the fifth, again, being that Manowar variant. I also have a couple of other cards that are not uh, in the top that I think are interesting or warrant some discussion that I want to talk about. I'm not sure if either of you have other cards that also come to mind. Yeah, I have one honorable mention that I'd like to bring up, so I guess I'll read it now. Archivist of Ogma is... One in a white for a creature halfling cleric. It has flash. It has the ability, whenever an opponent searches their library, you gain one life and draw a card, and it's a 2-2. Two -two. Now, it's only being tested by less than 5% of our respondents. They did give it a fairly high average rating of 2.3, 
So whether that's on power level or play pattern or whatever subjective criteria, people are like somewhat confident that this card will stick around in their cubes for the long term. And I would say that's a relatively high rating within this set, but not a high rating overall. There are definitely sets where we have dozens of cards that are uh, more highly rated than uh, this particular card. But in this set, it's in the top like, you know, 10 or 12 cards in terms of the overall rating. Yeah, top 10, I think. Yeah, so I, I mentioned this card because I think many curators are starting to break Singleton, especially on fetch lands and other fixing lands. So if you are a curator who does make that decision, as I do, I, I run three cycles of fetches, I think, at, at the current time. Archivist of Agma, of course, scales up vastly in power as you increase the number of fetch land cycles. And I think that it can actually provide a fairly fun play pattern. It, it's got this like hate bear stacks type of effect that we're used to seeing. But unlike a card like Leon and Arbiter, which taxes the opponent and prevents them from searching. Archivist of Augment isn't preventing your opponent from taking game actions in a like very blunt way. It It is providing instead a subtle nudge that your opponent might want to play their Trium before they play their fetch land or whatever. Yeah, I think it's pretty different giving you a benefit versus punishing your opponent for doing a thing. I know that, you know, in some senses, those could be, those could be considered two sides of the same coin. But if you compare this to, you know, a card like Esper Sentinel or Thalia. I guess Esper Sentinel is not a great example because your opponent has a choice there whether to give you something or to actually punish themselves. But uh, in the case of Thalia or other kinds of hate bears that just punish your opponent for playing a certain type of card or whatever, some players, I think, dislike that play pattern and are more okay with this kind of, you know, you get rewarded if your opponent does something as opposed to them getting punished. Yeah, I think the psychology is very different. I am surprised not to see this card higher for a couple of reasons. One is what you mentioned, Parker. I think if you are on a lot of fetch lands, a decent density of fetch lands, this card is potentially quite powerful. I mean, if you get to just play this as a two mana two two that draws a card and gains a life at instant speed, that's extremely powerful, right? Like that card, if that was just what the card said, would be one of the most powerful white two drops perhaps ever printed. Very high ceiling, certainly. And that obviously you could draw you many more cards if they continue to search their library for whatever reason. So I, I do think it's maybe more powerful than some players are giving it credit for. The other reason I'm surprised not to see it higher is because, you know, we mentioned how there's not competitive players that are out there making set reviews and talking about these cards because they are not really relevant for Eternal Magic or Constructed Magic. But this is a card that did definitely turn a bunch of heads for Constructed Commander, for actual, you know, regular Commander, and was talked about quite a bit. And so if there was any card that would benefit from, you know, the hype train, as it were, I would expect it to be this one. But we find it quite low in the list here and not a lot of players that are interested. I'd be curious if maybe people that are designing Commander Cube specifically either just don't find this effect appealing. You know, maybe they've uh, gotten a little bit exhausted from seeing Dockside Extortionist and some of these really powerful Commander cards again and again. So one of the reasons they might be turning to Commander Cube as opposed to just Commander is to kind of curate their environment a little bit and avoid some of those effects. So I, I could imagine people saying, yeah, that kind of effect just, just isn't preemptively being tired of it, even though they've just never played it. Or just not finding it particularly interesting or compelling or bringing something new. Obviously, it is making white yeah. powerful, but is that necessary uh, for everyone? The other thing I wonder about is maybe in different environments, this uh, shuffling your library, searching your library doesn't happen as often. So for maybe we're seeing a little bit of a slightly different audience with this particular survey of more people that are designing multiplayer and commander cubes, and maybe they're not running the three cycles of lands or a bunch of tutors and i definitely like wouldn't so, in multiplayer magic where i would yeah. be i would be looking to shorten mm, games by absolutely. every every means necessary and so maybe we're seeing that there's a two different groups of cube curators here parker so, you're on triple fetch lands are you testing this card i am i i don't have any plans to get a copy actually but like if i do then i will test it i have three cards that uh i want to talk about i guess you can call it honorable mentions i have three cards that are not in the top of the survey that i think are definitely worth perhaps a second look from cube designers and the first is displacer kitten this is three and a blue for a two two creature cat beast and it has an ability whenever you cast a non-creature spell exile up to one target non-land permanent you control then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control so you get to ephemerate any non-land permanent every time you cast a non-creature spell. I think this card is really, really cool. Like, super interesting design, uh, this weird combination of these different effects. And in cube design, we're so often looking to kind of bridge different uh, archetypes. And I know that 
Flicker is a very popular archetype. And I also know that the Spell Slinger archetype is something lots of cube designers pursue. And this card to me seems like it fits really nicely in a cube that supports both or one of these. It's also worth noting it does trigger on any non-creature spell. So if you're playing some sort of artifact or eggs deck, this could be really good there as well. And also can flicker any non-land permanent, which opens up some other opportunities to flicker sagas or planeswalkers to reset their loyalty or just a long tail of a cool interactions with this card that, you know, to me, this is so much more interesting than the than the new mana war. And yet it's only being tested by 5% of our respondents, uh, has more or less the same rating of the Archivist of Ogma at around 2.3. So the people that have flagged it I think maybe see that potential, but just a really cool card that I uh, I think more people maybe should be considering. Yeah, that's also a little surprising to me because I this is another card that I think among the commander community, there was a lot of discussion about. There was definitely a lot of discussion in CEDH because this card kind of becomes an instant win in the right deck with Spellseeker. And so you combine it with Spellseeker, you go get a spell, you can then cast that spell to re-trigger Spellseeker, you just can go get a chain of cards that eventually win you the game. I don't know if it's as popular in regular EDH communities. Frankly, I'm not a member of any of those, so I wouldn't know if it was talked about that much. Yeah, I, something I notice about the kitten is that its enabler and its payoff aren't necessarily maximized by the same resource. So like, it only triggers off of non-creatures, and then it could be flickering creature spells, and obviously your creatures won't trigger it. And so... The most efficient way to turn on this synergy as a deck builder and drafter is by, like you mentioned, Andy, picking sagas and planeswalkers, which is a really interesting way that this like incentive structure kind of degenerates. It appears to be a flicker card, but because it demands non-creature triggers, then it might not actually play out that way. Of course, all decks or many decks run a mixture of creature and non-creature, so you know, there's a caveat there. Yeah, I actually see that as an asset in a big way. Like you're saying, a lot of decks have a mixture of things, and I think that is what makes the game fun, is that every hand is going to be a little bit different. Games are going to play out differently. Uh, no, what makes the game fun is me winning, Anthony. Okay, sure. Me crushing the bones to that, of my opponent. I appreciate when you're winning with different kinds of things. You got <laughs> different lines of play and different choices to make. And as a deck builder, you have d- interesting choices about how to strike those balances and find out how to maximize those resources. So I don't love mechanics, at least not in huge volume, that are just do this thing, do as much of this as possible, put every single elf in your deck and you'll win with all these elves, but actually do ask you to try and balance difficult resource challenges. So yeah, I see that as all upside from a design perspective. I don't know. Don't you think the incentives will like just lead to saga tribal or whatever? Maybe not because sagas don't win the game by themselves, but I don't know. I think it would definitely depend on the environment. Honestly, maybe I'm guilty of the thing I just accused everybody of being guilty of. And I don't think I put this on my testing list, but I'm talking myself into it through this conversation for my synergy cube, which is a cube that I haven't discussed much on the show, but I've been tinkering with for, I don't know, six or eight months now. And what I'm really excited about in that cube with this is just playing like Mycosynth Wellspring, Prophetic Prism, mm-hmm. all these cheap little oh, yeah. artifacts. There's like, a, there's like an artifact theme in that cube and a lot of egg style artifacts that can trip or do some other sort of enter the battlefield ability. And that is the thing where the incentive structure is perfectly aligned, right? Because that's both going to trigger and be relevant to be targeted with that and uh, with that ability, which uh, yeah, maybe that's a specific cube thing, but I, I just think there's a lot of untapped potential here in a card that does a thing we've never seen another card do. And uh, I don't know, it just seems very promising for me big picture design perspective yeah yeah like so many things i think that context matters so much on this card turbo cube i considered it a little bit we'll we'll give we'll give it some more thoughts the next card i want to talk about is also a blue card and it's also being tested by a similar chunk of respondents and that's young blue dragon this is an adventure card the creature side is four and a blue for a creature dragon that's a three three flyer very straightforward and it comes stapled to this sorcery called sand augury which is one and a blue to scry one, then draw a card. This is a common, and I think it's very well-balanced common. This is also just like a, a little tiny tweak in terms of power level off for being a card I'd be really excited to test in my cube. Compared to something like Timeless Dragon, which a lot of people really, really like, uh, that's a card that has plane cycling, so two mana, go find a planes, as opposed to two mana, scry one, draw a card. Also, the instant versus sorcery speed thing is relevant there. And then the creature side of Thomas Dragon is quite a bit more appealing as a five mana, four, four flyer, or a four mana, four, four flyer out of the graveyard, where this is a five mana, three, three flyer. But a card that almost nobody is testing, but I think is a, a very neat, tidy little design, very clean on both sides, that uh, if I were playing a lower power cube, I'd be all over this. 
And uh, I even like, I did think about it for my very high powered environment because I do love modality so much and just being able to put another cantrip in your deck that sometimes can also just be a five mana dragon. It seems very powerful. Yeah, I thought about this immediately for you, your cube as well, because I know you love cantrips. Yeah, I do. And even though this is, you know, a common from a supplementary set with a very specific focus isn't usually where you're looking, it really does just scream like, this is a cheap cantrip that kind of draws you two cards. It's kind of just a two mana draw two, even if one side is a little bit uh, maybe underpowered. That's still a powerful package altogether. Yeah, that's, wanna... a, that's a really powerful way to put it. It is a two mana draw two. And it's not just that, it's a scry one draw two. You're right. going to draw a card off the top of your library and you're going to draw a five mana three three flyer. I would compare it maybe some, to something like Omen of the Sea, which does something similar in keeping cards flowing while giving you a little bit of card advantage. Obviously, Omen of the Sea has a lot of interesting interactions, maybe with Displacer Kitten. There but you go, baby. We got there. Yeah. I think this is still an interesting card. I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's very well balanced, very flavorful. And I am, in fact, I mentioned that Eldraine Remastered Cube that I have, and I am just unbelievably pumped to add this to that environment. Yeah, that'll be sick there, I think. It's you know what else perfect. I love about this card is for all of that, Seven words of rules text. Yeah, seven mm -hmm. words of rules text on a type of card, adventure cards that tend to be maybe kind of weighty in terms of rules text. But here it's like so clean, such a clean design. It might win my cleanest card of the set award, which I just mm. invented and have decided to give out to a uh, young blue <laughs> dragon slash sand augury. Can we make a retroactive article with cleanest card of the set for all previous sets? I'll just go back and add it to every other set. No one will ever know. How will they prove give them it? A little gold sticker. Yeah, exactly. The last card I want to talk about that is not in the uh, top four cards of the set that we'll get to is Delayed Blast Fireball. This is one red red for an instant. Deals two damage to each opponent and each creature they control. It also has Foretell for four red red. So a much more expensive Foretell cost, which is a little odd for what we know that mechanic to be. But it also has this rules text that says, if you cast this spell from exile, it deals five damage to each opponent and each creature they control instead. I'm not testing this card but it's not because I don't think it's powerful. I think this card is really, really powerful, and I'm flagging it because I know that a lot of our respondents are playing power-motivated cubes. They are interested in testing some of the most powerful cards from each set, and I think a lot of people are overlooking this on raw power level. We talked just a couple weeks ago about how in my cube and a lot of cubes like it, two damage kills a ton of threats, well over half of the creatures in my cube. So even just on the front side, you know, being an instant, Three mana card that's going to oftentimes be a two for one, maybe more, is very, very appealing. I mean, you say two for one. I read this card and I'm seeing a three mana Plague Wound that also does two damage to your opponent. Like It will this... it will sometimes be that, yes. And I'm, I'm with and you. And like, speed. I'm not advocating that people should be playing more powerful cards, but I know, like you say, that a lot of people are. That's, like, that's what gets them excited about. Right. And so are my card evaluation skills that off that I'm thinking this card is insane? And I so few people don't are think people are looking at it. I don't think people are digging into it for all the reasons we mentioned. I don't think many people have given it much thought. Or maybe people don't like the idea of three mana Plague Wind because that doesn't sound like fun to me. <laughs> That's why I'm not testing it. The other reason I'm not testing is because of the, uh, you know, the fact that if you cast it from exile, it becomes almost literally Plague Wind plus a Lava Axe stapled to it. You know, I think... If you do that for the Fertel cost, it's pretty fair. At that point, you've spent eight mana on it. Your opponent has had some time to do something. At the point where in most games you have that much mana, maybe you deserve, you know, effect that that swingy. But sometimes you're just going to free roll this off of your Lelia or off of your Reckless Impulse or off of your Light at the Stage. One of these ways that we have this impulsive draw cards in red that let you just... And they keep printing more and more of them. They keep printing more of them. There's, there's a lot of those cards that are in a lot of cubes. And so the idea of free rolling that Plague Wind by pure chance is something that is not at all appealing to me. Now, to some people, that might be a cool synergy, right? They like the idea of someone getting a Delayed Blast Fireball and then taking a card like Lelia or Reckless Impulse or Light at the Stage more highly. Um, for me, that's the kind of variance I'm trying to cut down on, which is the other reason I'm not particularly interested in this card. But I'm flagging it because I think on pure power level, I would expect more players to at least be giving it a shot because we do know historically from looking at this set survey that power level is a big driving force in terms of the cards people are actually testing in their environments. Parker, how good do you think Delayed Blast Fireball is? I think it's pretty crazy strong. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that was said. I'm, again, not testing it kind of similar to y'all. I'm not really interested in this play pattern in particular and not sparking joy anyways. So, Anthony, do you have any cards that 
you are interested in talking about from this set. I know you mentioned earlier today that you were going to have to read all the cards before the podcast. I get the sense you didn't follow this set very closely when it was being spoiled. Uh, it has been a little hard to keep up with this set. I, I, again, I'm interested in the the gates. They're not something that I'm going to be including in any of my cubes, but I'm really curious to see what people do with them. And uh, in multiplayer cubes, what people do with the initiative and Myriad as well. So, yeah, I think there's a lot here that is very cool, but just doesn't suit necessarily any of the projects that I'm working on right now. You got nothing. I got nothing. Gavin, you missed. Anthony doesn't like any of these cards. Go back to the drawing board. I'm Gavin Verhey from Wizards of the Coast. Today I want to tell you that I deeply regret making Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate. Should we dive into the top four cards from the set then? Let's do it. All right, the number four most popular card from Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate is Great Sword of Tear. Tur? Tear? Probably Tear, right? Probably Tur. This is one and a white for an artifact equipment. It has equipped for a white. And it says, whenever a quip creature attacks, put a plus one, plus one counter on it, and tap up to one target creature defending player controls. This is being tested by 11% of our respondents, average rank of 2.1, which is pretty middling. So a lot of people trying it out, but they're like, I don't know, it doesn't seem great. It's like Luminarch Aspirant and Territorial Hammer Skull on the same card. What's not to like? I got excited about this card when I saw it, to be honest, for that reason. I think it definitely has some real snowball potential. And I'm always interested in cards in my aggressive decks that can deal with my opponent's creatures, but don't only do that. Because when you're up against a control opponent or something, uh, your removal spells might just be dead cards. And sometimes having dead cards in your hand, if you're an aggressive deck, can be a really huge liability because your whole strategy is to try and spend all your mana every turn keep the pressure on your opponent and if you're just holding swords to plowshares and prismatic ending and your opponent has no targets for either of those spells then uh, they're kind of wasted space and so great sort of tier to me is really exciting because it puts on additional pressure if uh if you need to put on additional pressure but also can clear basically your opponent's best blocker every turn which i think is very promising it does have the interesting fact that it puts the plus one plus one counter on the creature which depending on your perspective, could be better or worse than putting a counter on the sword that makes the sword a better equipment later. You know, it has the uh, advantage of if your opponent is packing artifact removal, it will leave behind any counters it put on creatures, which is good. But it has this advantage of your opponent's packing creature removal, then this great sword goes back to being essentially a plus one plus one, right? Because that's what it's going to give it on the first attack. And only if you're attacking, not if you're defending. I, I would say most environments, you're more likely to have creature removal than artifact removal. So that is probably a, a slight nerf to the card rather than the card itself getting bigger, like uh, in a Lion Sash style way, where then it makes the thing it's equipped to also commensurately larger. But I think this is kind of promising. This is on my testing list. I'm fairly skeptical of it. It is still two mana equipment with equip one, which is a decent amount of mana. I think it compares somewhat favorably, though, to Maul of the Skyclaves, which I know a lot of people mm. really like, uh, just in the fact that they are both three mana to play and equip. Uh, in the case of Maul of the Skyclaves, it's three mana and it auto equips. In the case of Great Sword of Tear, it's two mana and you pay one to equip, which you can argue about the they're very different in terms of their board impact and what they actually do once they're equipped. But I think people would maybe read this differently if it was a three mana thing that auto equip when it came into play. But because people don't see it that way, I think maybe they're a little lower on it, perhaps. But I'm curious what you all think of this card. I think it's pretty cool. And I do especially like the fact that it puts counters on the creatures just because I think that is going to create a lot of interesting lines of play, especially when it's sort of like I'm going to give my creature the sword and then power it up until it's big enough to not be able to block your second or not be able to be killed by your second biggest creature. And then I'm going to move this over to my, one of my new creatures, some small creature and start powering that up. So I think it gives you a lot of interesting flexibility in terms of how you use it, not just as an equipment to make one creature bigger, but as a, a part of a plan across multiple turns to sort of sculpt your board state. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Is the flavor here that this sword is so big and heavy that using it makes you stronger? Is that what's happening here? Mm. This is like a buster sword kind of situation where the sword is like comically large? I think it's because the light of its gleaming blade makes the faithful shine. That was as, my read as well. Yeah, which is on the flavor text. So I think you just get more... Faithful? Faithful? Holy? <laughs> Shining? Question mark? Well, you know, we, I, between the three of us, we don't know pretty much anything about the flavor of Baldur's Gate, the IP from which this is inspired by and borrowing. So I'm sure people that do know that are screaming about what the Great Sword of Tear actually is and how this makes sense for the story behind this sword. But 
I got none of that. It's worth knowing this card is a common, which I do also think, honestly, is the thing that will cause people to underrate cards because yeah. they're so conditioned to look at the set symbol as some sort of clue for how good Wizards of the Coast believes that card to be in limited because that's very often strongly correlated with the actual rarity of the card. But in a multiplayer environment, this card is much weaker, obviously, because it is a one-on-one -on -one aggressive card that requires you to be attacking, and it doesn't in any way solve the disincentivization problem of attacking in a multiplayer environment. So I think this is maybe one of those cards that is going to get a significant power boost in one-on-one -on -one magic versus multiplayer magic, which could account for perhaps the unintuitive set symbol that we see here with this thing at common. Yeah, that's actually shocking. I didn't realize it was a common. The, it reads like a rare to me, to be honest. And I, I guess it is just a factor of, of multiplayer being such a different context. Yeah, and like for context, I think this would be kind of broken in most popper cubes. Like this seems way better than any... Well, I mean, Beth Bone Splitter is a common equipment too. It's probably better than this. But this is a lot better than a lot of the other options uh, that you're playing at, at a common power level. So... Um, something to keep in mind, maybe, if you are playing a rarity-restricted environment. I really like that the ways in which the Greatsword is good are pushing games to end faster. And, I mean, I guess all equipments kind of do that. Greatsword wants to be attacking. It wants to be on creatures attacking. The same could be said of Bone Splitter. But this is a little bit more interactable. If your opponent kills your creature, unlike Bone Splitter, you can't just snap it on a different creature and have the same boost of power it actually matters a little bit how much you've invested into this great sword yeah i i think it offers some interesting decisions it also synergizes with stoneforge mystic which is relevant in my environment so i'll be testing this and i'm i'm actually pretty optimistic about it yeah i just think the line of being any kind of aggressive deck playing a threat on turn one playing a threat on turn two Maybe your opponent then plays some good blocker and thinks like, all right, I've stabilized unless they have a removal spell. But worse, not only do you have a spell that effectively you know, removes their blocker, but it also makes your attack even better, which is something yeah. we don't get that often. And then if they play a better blocker, guess what? Now that one is nullified and you can deal with the less good one. Maybe your creature's big enough now that they exactly. don't have advantageous blocks. So I, I think it's got some very potentially powerful lines and maybe that's worth the risk of playing a three mana to cast and equip kind of card. I mean, Umazawa's Jute would do the same thing, but it just does it in a way that feels much more hopeless for your opponent. Like, yeah, both are pushing games to end, but Greatsword allows more interactivity and more exchange of tempo between the two players as they're kind of managing this game piece. And with Jute, it's like the same thing happens, but it degenerates the game state in a way that's not always fun. So Yeah, well, one way to maybe make Jute a little more fair would be if the counters it would be clunky in terms of rules text but if the counters were on the creature such that you couldn't just leave them on your sword when that creature died and then use them yeah. at any point later on if you were forced in the face of a removal spell to just gain some life or whatever because otherwise those counters are not going to be useful to you later on that would maybe be an unearth to that card which kind of gets at describing the play patterns and power level of greatsword here so our third most popular card of baldur's gate is noble's purse it is a two mana artifact it enters the battlefield tapped and with three coin counters on it, and it has the ability to tap, remove a coin counter, create a treasure token. It is tested by 11% of our respondents with an average rank of 2.1. So I don't know. Maybe it's been so long since I've cut signets that I, I no longer understand the appeal of a signet, but I think that's what's going on here. I think the people who are interested in this card are seeing a mana rock that taps for any color of mana. It only does it three times, and it's not quote-unquote fast mana where it can kind of refund itself the turn it comes into play, but it does make a lot of game objects, and it makes a lot of colored mana, so I think in some contexts this could be pretty interesting. This card is very similar to a card maybe you're not familiar with, Parker, which is Sphere of the Suns, which is yeah. another two-mana mana rock, comes into play tapped, it has counters on it, and you can only tap it three times for colored mana, basically. And I played that in the early days of my cube when I was on a lot of two-mana mana rocks because it was a two-mana mana rock, and I was kind of tapped out on those at that point. But here, I really like this, which I think is almost universally a powered-up version of that card because you can still play it the same way, right? If you just want to get three colored mana out of it on subsequent turns, you know, you can just do that. But the fact that it does make these separate treasures gives you additional 
interplay with any kind of artifact matters deck, additional interplay with anything that cares about artifacts entering the battlefield or the number of artifacts you have. It also allows you to, absent any of that, just save up that mana to then use in a big burst on, you know, turn four or five or whatever, where instead of having to, you know, spend one a turn, you get to kind of make a bunch of treasure tokens and then make some giant explosive play, which uh, could be could be something that turns a game around that otherwise you wouldn't have access to. So I yeah. really like this card. If you're interested in two mana mana rocks, I think it is a, a very compelling design. You know, I'm bummed out by entering the battlefield tapped. I think it's it may be important for the balance of the card, but it, it definitely cuts down on my joy of a card when I play it and I don't get to do the thing immediately. I have to wait. But other than that, I think the card is really elegant. I, I've put this in my Synergy Cube, which again has that artifact theme, and I think it's really potent there. The number two card from the set is Gut, True Soul Zealot. This is two and a red for a legendary creature, Goblin Shaman. It's a 2-2. Two, two. Whenever you attack, you may sacrifice another creature or artifact. If you do, create a 4-1 black skeleton creature token with menace that's tapped and attacking, and it also has Choose a Background. This is a pretty cool little card for anything that's caring about sacrifice energies. It just lets you cycle your creatures or artifacts. Maybe it lets you cycle your noble's purse that's run out of coins for creatures that maybe you sacrificed for more things. And I, it's an awesome little package. It's getting your little gears turning. This is a card I expected to be tested by more people as well because it's it's kind of like a funky goblin rabble master in that you know it's a three mana two two that can have an immediate board impact in the sense that it cares about whenever you attack at all. This card does not have to be attacking. So you can play this pre-combat, attack with anything else, and you have the option of upgrading whatever you're attacking with into a four-arm black skeleton creature token, or you know just sacrificing a treasure or whatever you have laying around, which Rabble Master has synergy with the sacrifice decks in the sense that it makes tokens and you may want to sacrifice them, but this is a more novel and perhaps more direct way to synergize with that, where if you care about supporting red aggressive decks and also red aristocrat style decks or sacrifice themes, which I know a lot of cube designers do. This seems like it's almost a win across the board. I think maybe one thing keeping this card down is the unique token problem, which many cube designers wrestle with. If you don't pay attention to this, you end up with a cube that has 65 different unique tokens. And this is a token we've never seen before. So maybe that's keeping some people away. But did I forget to mention it also has choose a background. So you said that I don't think most of our cube designers are playing that rules text, which I'm only gleaning by the relative unpopularity of all the other Choose a Background cards. So I think the fact that this one stands out above the others and the fact that Choose a Background kind of only works with a certain density tells me that these 13% of people, most of them are not actually caring about the background text. And so it's kind of just extra distraction text there. We've also seen no backgrounds in our survey response as far as I can tell. None at all, or just none. Like I'm looking and I don't think any pass our threshold. So yeah, none tested by telling. more than like 10 people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, for me, that text is definitely in almost any cube environment that I'm building a negative. Uh, if I'm in, there's so many magic cards. This card is not so unique that having an extra line of rules text as literally meaning meaningless is not a pretty major negative to the card. It's pretty unique. It's not unique enough. <laughs> I wonder how unique it would have to be before you would be willing to put it. I, I, would, so, I would posit maybe no amount of uniqueness would make you put a card in your cube that said choose a background. The uniqueness threshold for me for something like that is Bergy in Turbo Cube, where it's like that card really enables something very interesting Just because it says partner on it. Uh, no, because it's a double face card. Oh, well, I'm... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that that seems way less distracting than, you know, the back face of Bergy is oftentimes relevant. That seems True. way less distracting than literal rules text that means nothing. True. Anyway, uh, I think the card is cool. And I think if you're into any kind of red sacrifice deck, it's really nice that this does bridge multiple kinds of sacrifice decks. Because again, turn your treasures or your, you know, chromatic stars or spheres or whatever dinky little artifacts you have laying around into 4-1 creatures with menace. It's pretty good. 4-1 menace is a very good stat line. That is... You know, it's going to trade with two things. It hits a lot of time. very, very hard, and is either going to have to eat some kind of removal spell in the worst case, you know, maybe half of a fork bolt or something. But uh, most of the time, it's going to demand a double block, which is going to almost certainly take out two of their blockers in most cases, or one of their best blockers. So uh, I think that this card has a lot of potential power level, and again, only thirteen percent of people think of this exact card. Maybe minus the choose a background text was put into a standard legal set, this number would be two or three times as high. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Yeah. That brings us to our number one most tested card from Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate. This card has the second highest rank after all of the gate cards, which we've already talked about. 
and it's being tested by, again, only about 13% of our respondents. So the number one card is not a home run by any stretch of the imagination. But this is Minsk and Boo, Timeless Heroes. This is a Planeswalker, Minsk, for two red green, so four mana. It's got starting loyalty three. It has a triggered ability. When Minsk and Boo, Timeless Heroes, enters the battlefield and at the beginning of your upkeep, you may create Boo, a legendary 1-1 red hamster creature token with trample and haste. It has a plus one loyalty ability to put three plus one plus one counters on up to one target creature with trample or haste. It has a minus two loyalty ability to sacrifice a creature. When you do, Minsk and Boo Timeless Heroes deals X damage to any target where X is that creature's power. If the sacrificed creature was a hamster, draw X cards. And it has the line of text, Minsk and Boo Timeless Heroes can be your commander. Is this the wordiest card we've seen printed ever that's not double face? I posit perhaps maybe. It's certainly a lot, and it certainly has some very unique text that makes it a little bit harder to parse. Like, if the sacrifice creature was a hamster, this is a this is a, a joke that I think gets overused a bit. But uh, this really does look like it came from the R Custom Magic subreddit, right? The size of the text on this text box looks like comically small, and all of these combinations of abilities I think are are really kind of hard to parse. And I think we should walk through what I think mostly the sort of normal play pattern of this card is going to be to get a sense for how it might play. So to me, you know, it's a Planeswalker, you're playing it when you have four mana, and when it enters the battlefield, you get a 1-1 in addition to your three mana loyalty Planeswalker, and then you can immediately plus to put three plus on plus one counters on that hamster creature token and make a 4-4 with trample and haste for your four mana and have a Planeswalker with four loyalty left behind. Now, I did say you can do that immediately. This is a very unique Planeswalker that I think only a couple other Planeswalkers in all of history have this unique kind of interaction with the rules of the game, which is that normally the play pattern of Planeswalkers is you cast them. If they resolve, you immediately activate their loyalty ability, which means that your opponent never has an opportunity to bolt your three loyalty Planeswalker because if you immediately plus it, then it's already out of bolt range before they get priority. Here, because this has a triggered ability... Minsk and Boo is going to come into play. That trigger is going to go on the stack, and your opponent will have an opportunity to potentially bolt this and leave you with a dinky little 1-1 one, one for all of your work. I personally don't think that that takes the card down in power level almost at all, but uh, that is a relevant thing to be aware of, that this that is pretty unique to this Planeswalker. Perhaps more relevant is that like, if you play this and you don't have another... Well, let's see. You have to declare the target as you are activating the plus one, and... Boo is vulnerable to every piece of removal under the sun, more or less. That is true. So I'd be almost more concerned about being left with a planeswalker and no creature to defend it rather than the other way around. Yep, that is also a real possibility. So, you know, I think the normal play pattern is extremely powerful, right? If you do get the 4-4 four, four with Trample and Haste and you are left behind with Minsk and Boo on 4 Loyalty... That is extraordinarily powerful. A 4-4 with Trample and Haste is already a decent reward for 4 mana in most environments, and you have a very good Planeswalker to go along with it. And then next turn, if you still have that uh, Minsk token laying around, you get to downtick by 2, sacrifice it, deal 4 damage to any target, so remove your uh, a good creature of your opponent's, deal 4 damage to their face if nothing else going on, and then you draw 4 cards, which is obscene. Like, if, if you get to do... Those two turns with this card, you get to attack once with a 4-4 with Trample Haste, then you get to sacrifice it to draw four cards and deal four to anything. That's incredible value. That's a, that's a cool six for one if you count the that's Planeswalker a, left behind too. That's incredible value yeah. for your four mana investment. So I think the ceiling on this card is really, really high. It does have a couple more fragile interaction points than some other plane. I mean, it's hard to compare this to any other Planeswalker, but you know, I think Planeswalkers are oftentimes marked by their consistency in that you're going to cast it you're going to get to activate it at least once and so even if your opponent has a removal spell for the token it made or has a removal spell for the planeswalker you still got something out of it and this is a little more volatile where a well-placed disfigure on the minsk token that you can then attack minsk and boo or a well-placed lightning bolt on minsk and boo leaves you with a one one there are definitely ways that you can disassemble this uh this package but i think it's an extremely powerful card i'm not playing it for all of the text on it, and also because I think it would be a, a too powerful play pattern that I would not be excited about in my environment. Uh, it just so much text. Also, just you so know much what's text. funny? This card 
is very similar in functionality to Questing Beast. And it actually makes Questing Beast look good in terms of rules text. In the it, sense ma- of it makes Questing four Beast mana, look clean. Four mana, your yeah. opponent is demoralized by the wall of text. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Four mana, your but, opponent says, what does that do again? I know it's bad for me, but I don't know what it does. And then every turn, you just get to, if Minsk dies, make another Minsk. Uh, you know, it's worth noting you can't, in the same turn, sacrifice Minsk to the minus two and also get the token again because it is a legendary token, so... <laughs> If you are uh, making another one, you're going to have to sacrifice one to the legend rule. And you can only do that on upkeep or when it enters the battlefield. So I guess you could flicker it with your displacer kitten after you uh, minus two it to make another 4-4 four, four with trample and haste. And then you're really doing it. Andy, I hate to say it, but you mixed up Minsk and Boo, which now I'm left with the indelible mental image of a small hamster sacrificing a man every turn. <laughs> I am glad I mixed it up because it is performance art for how complicated and confusing all the text on this card is. Love it. This to me is a prime example of why I think a lot of our respondents care about power level because I think if you, I think power level is the only redeeming thing about this card, frankly. I, I dislike the play pattern so much. The rules text is so wordy and so complicated. It has the can be your commander line of rules text, which is not going to matter for anybody except for commander cube designers out there. And yet it is the most popular card in the set because I think it does offer a potentially very powerful package. I do think maybe this card was a tiny, teensy bit overhyped. Uh, if we look at just the price history of it, it was certainly a card that people thought early on was going to be a huge outlier in terms of demand, and it maybe hasn't turned out to be quite that. But I do still think it's a very powerful package, and I think that's why we see people playing it. Ranking of 2.6. I'm not sure I said that. Just below the uh, the gate lands that we talked about at 2.7. If you're interested in powerful red-green four-mana things, might I recommend Blood Braid Elf, which only has two pieces of rules text. Bloodbraid Elf is part of a collection of cards, Parker, that have me continuing to try and investigate in my own soul and heart what kinds of variants I am okay with in Magic, right? Because we've talked a lot on this show about how I'm a fan of giving my players tools to mitigate variants and having that be a core part of how they strategize and play the game. And so Cascade on its face is not a line of text that I should like, and yet I'm drawn like a like a moth to flame to Bloodbraid Elf. And then I play it in my cube and it just keeps getting me a mana dork every single time. And I'm like, I, I hate this mechanic. This is so dumb. It's getting back out. It's up there with cards like Eureka is another card that has variants built in that I still just feels really appealing to me. And I'm still just, you know, forever unpacking, you know, what I actually care about in terms of uh, the variants in Magic. Everybody knows that's what the game of Magic is about, is like unraveling your own soul and desires through these ridiculous game mechanics yeah that but for real and for some of us that's miniature giant space hamsters i did (laughs) in the first eight person draft with my cube i got eureka with the treasure cruise by my opponent and i didn't even mind that much hi andy here a small update from what is the future from the perspective of us speaking on this podcast but of course the past from your perspective I was actually talking about the first eight-person draft of my cube after adding Eureka in, not the first eight-person draft ever, which would be very confusing as that was well before Eureka was printed. So time crimes abound. Wasn't that weird? You'd think I'd it's really mind. Feeling. It's think a good I'd, feeling. It's a good you think I'd really mind, but I was like, you know what? You're so happy. I'm just happy for you <laughs> that I just took nine off of your <laughs> off of your effective two drop because you ninjutsued it in and you drew yeah. a card. Good for I've, you. You got there. My first draft with Yuriko, my opponent returned Snapcaster Mage with the Ninjutsu trigger. Oof. Oh, wow. That's And valuable. then flipped Tassiger off the top. Mm. So Pretty good. Pretty powerful. I really got beat. Yeah. That's a card that if it didn't have Commander Ninjutsu, I would like it so much more. Not only because I think Commander Ninjutsu, if you don't read the full rules text, some people might think you can't regularly Ninjutsu it because it sounds like you can only Ninjutsu it from the command zone. But in fact, it means you can ninjutsu it from either the command zone or your hand. Just, ugh. Were we too negative on this episode? What do you think? I think that anybody who is listening to Lucky Paper Radio for the first time because they have a uh, commander cube and wanted to listen to this set result, I don't think they're any longer listening. So Darn it! <laughs> <laughs> Shit! We can say whatever we want now. How are we going to continue to, to grow our media empire if we keep scaring people away with our thoughts about the line of text can be your commander. 
we got to figure out how we can combine all of our least favorite mechanics into one. Like, a it's a double face card that can be your commander <laughs> only if you. The, the back face of a double face card can be your commander, but not the front face. The what front that, face lets what does you that choose mean? a background. Yeah, the front face lets you choose a background. And also, <laughs> it's got. Um, cascade. Double cascade. And it gains you 40 life. Yeah. And there's the battlefield gains 50 life. It has companion, but it's a different <laughs> it's a different effect that lets you have another creature that it isn't a legend. Initiative companion? As, <laughs> but it's called the same, but it's a different mechanic. It's called companions it lets you have, forever. It lets you have three other <laughs> three other commanders. Um, oh no. Well, we got more negative after we talked about whether or not it was negative. Anyway, that's it for our Commander's <laughs> Legend Battle for Baldur's Gate set review. Let us know in the comments if we got too negative or if uh, you're here for it. We want to know what you think. And uh, I definitely encourage everybody to dive into the fantastic perspective article that Parker wrote for the set, which includes the full results from the survey. We only touched on a few cards here for all the reasons we mentioned. But as we said, this is a very deep card file that I think people have not really explored that much. So if yeah, I you- think we maybe are a little bit sort of fulfilling the the thing that we said people shouldn't be doing, which is, you know, this is another set with lots of cards that just because it's not getting the exposure from being part of premier formats, it, it, it deserves more attention because there's a lot there. And here we are with our enthusiasm waning a little bit. Hey, look, I said Displacer Kitten was really cool and I really liked Young Blue Dragon. You had nothing positive to contribute. You're like, I haven't even read these cards. I'm too busy. This is exhausting. Yeah, I I do want to underscore that this card file is really deep and really novel. It kind of was a way for Wizards designers to flex their kind of nostalgic muscles in a way that they don't always get to do, bringing back these one-off mechanics and these pieces of nostalgia I'll, I'll confess that I was negative because for the third set review in a row, as I was walking home to record this with y'all, it started raining on me. So, <laughs> oh no, it's a tradition. You know, I've been damp for the last three set reviews. And I'm not <laughs> you know, you're allowed that. to change out of your clothes when you get home. You don't have to immediately <laughs> hop on the mic. We uh, we are not that uh, that <laughs> pressed for time here. I you know I, I want to represent. So, anyways, like setting aside all of that, this this is really a really fascinating and deep and well-designed set. And and I think it's worth a serious look. And on that positive note, that is the end of Lucky Paper Radio. Thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all at KubeCon. Parker, Anthony, and I just booked our uh, booked our Airbnb for KubeCon, so we're going to be there. So uh, you got to come out and hang out with us. We're probably going to road trip it, so we'll see how that goes. We'll see you all in Madison in October. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This show is produced by a wet, soggy Parker sitting down on his chair, just dripping, (laughs) talking about the latest commander set with us over Zoom. Thank you, Parker. It is my pleasure. And one last big thank you just to everybody who submitted to the survey and participated in getting these results that it's going to be a resource for the community. Do sign up for our newsletter so you can make sure not to miss the Double Masters survey coming out very soon. (laughs) And shout out to Darth Hippo, who is testing 330 oh some cards. You know, we, oh, we, got a, we got a bug report from Darth Hippo, who was like, I submitted my survey, but uh, it, it, said, it gave me an error. The error was that when the survey <laughs> submits, we have the uh, results of the survey post to a channel in, in our private Discord so we can see the results as they come in. And uh, this testing results list was too long for the character limit of Discord. So uh, that's why that didn't work. And I wrote a bad integration that failed because of that (laughs) well i mean would you ever expect a five thousand character testing survey from somebody you gotta expect it that's what being a qa engineer is all about which is not what i am which is why i let that happen expect the unexpected (laughs) 338 cards is larger than most standard legal releases so i think this is a record that will stand for a long time it's larger than most of my cubes (laughs) (laughs) yeah so bravo darth truly 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 All right, the number two card that the most second most number of people who responded to the survey are interested in. You're doing great, buddy. Um, <laughs> the number two card, based on how many people are testing it from this set, is Gut True Zealot. That's a pretty cool name. Uh, how often do you meet a guy named Zet? How often do you... <laughs>
just going to cut all that. It's also true soul, Zelda. You didn't say soul. <laughs> if we're going to go back and do it again. The number two card from Commander... Oh, f- me. What is the set called? Commander Legends <laughs> Commander Battle, Legends for, Battle Baldur's for Baldur's, Baldur's Gate. Gate. It's in the URL. You can look at it and I read it I have to there. zoom in to read this tiny, tiny text. <laughs> yeah, we're going to just gonna start. <laughs> <laughs> this is not our best work. No. It'll sound great once it's edited. Great. Yeah.